AI-powered AR reads your mind. Plus, you won't believe what Spotify does with data about you. Welcome to 2024, where your digital twin can predict diseases before you feel a single symptom, and AI might know you're depressed before you do. Sound like sci-fi? Think again. Healthcare is about to make your wildest tech dreams or nightmares come true. Buckle up, because we're diving headfirst into a world where the line between human and digital health is blurrier than your vision after a VR marathon. All right, you brilliant biotech pioneers and wellness warriors, brace yourselves for another mind-bending episode. I'm your host, Theodore, reluctantly ready to be your guide through the digital labyrinth of health tech that's rewiring our bodies faster than you can say genetic algorithm. Oh, and before my brain decides to wander off into a tangent about the fascinating history of the stethoscope, did you know it was invented because a doctor felt awkward putting his ear directly on a woman's chest? Talk about a game changer. Let me introduce our resident experts, Gwen, our AI health hacker, and Charlie, our digital wellness wizard. Today, my dear cellular cyborgs, we're diving headfirst into the world of AI and its impact on, well, every cell in your body. From digital twins that let doctors experiment on virtual you, finally, a use for cloning that doesn't involve evil scientists, to AI that can spot depression in your tweets faster than your therapist. We're talking health tech so advanced it might diagnose your hypochondria before you can Google your symptoms. So sync up those synapses, my cherished corporeal explorers. Whether you're a medtech maven, a wellness junkie, or just someone who's wondered if your Fitbit is judging your life choices, this episode is your prescription for understanding the AI-powered health revolution that's about to rewrite your medical records. And remember, this is episode 19 of our Innovations in Wellness and the Future of Healthy Living series, part of an entire day exploring creative realms and professional growth. Today we're seeing how AI is not just changing how we treat illness, but potentially redefining what it means to be healthy. Let's embark on this digital diagnosis and see if we can decode the future of healthcare before my attention span decides to create its own virtual wellness retreat again. Okay, so get this. Mm -hmm. You give a computer some text. Okay. And it can tell you if the person who wrote it is happy or sad. Wow. And maybe even hangry. Interesting. That's basically sentiment analysis. Uh -huh. But get this. Okay. Researchers are using a similar idea to build digital twins. Yeah. But of our immune systems. Interesting. It sounds like sci-fi, but this is really happening. It is. So are you ready to like deep dive into this stuff? Yeah, let's do it. What we're really talking about here is teaching machines to understand what it means to be human from yeah. our emotions to the complexities of our own bodies. Totally. It's like you're trying to translate between two completely different universes. It is. Yeah. You have this crazy, unpredictable world of human emotions on one side mm -hmm. and then like cold, hard computer logic on the other. Yeah. So where do you even begin with that? Well, with sentiment analysis, you have to break down emotions into something a computer can understand. Okay. Think of it like a spectrum. Okay. The most basic sentiment analysis might just be able to tell if something is positive or negative. Right. But it can get a lot more detailed than that. Okay. So, like, if I tweet, this pizza is giving me life, mm -hmm. a basic analysis would probably just flag that as positive because of the word life. Right. But what if I was being sarcastic? Like, what if I tweeted, my internet connection is so reliable? said no one ever. Yeah. Would a computer be able to understand that? That's the million dollar question. And the short answer is sometimes. Okay. Sarcasm, humor, slang. These are all things computers have traditionally struggled with because they require a lot of context and shared understanding. Right. And those are things that come naturally to humans. Right. Of course. Not so much to computers. So how do researchers actually teach a computer to understand something like sarcasm right. which is so nuanced it's a huge challenge yeah but they are making progress okay one of the most exciting developments is the use of deep learning okay and this is where instead of just giving a computer a dictionary of happy words and sad words right deep learning actually 
builds complex neural networks okay. that mimic the human brain. Wow. So it's like going from a basic calculator to like a super powered AI brain. Exactly. Wow. This lets these deep learning algorithms process information on a bunch of different levels mm -hmm. and actually understand context in a way that wasn't possible before. Okay. It's like the difference between just seeing individual words and understanding the meaning of a full sentence mm -hmm. complete with all the subtle cues I, and the way we talk. That's wild. It is. But this all sounds very theoretical. Okay. Where are we seeing sentiment analysis being used in the real world today? Oh, it's everywhere. Really? Yeah. Companies are using it right now to understand customer feedback from things like product reviews and social media posts. Oh. In fact, there was one study that showed businesses that use sentiment analysis actually see like a 20% increase in customer satisfaction. Wow. Because they're able to respond to complaints quicker and more effectively. So you're saying my angry tweets about my internet being slow could actually lead to better service. It's possible. That's both impressive and kind of terrifying at the same time. Yeah. And it's not just customer service. Okay. Researchers are figuring out how sentiment analysis of social media posts can actually help identify people who are at risk of mental health conditions like depression. Wow. Which could lead to earlier interventions. That's amazing. So this technology could potentially save lives. That's the hope. Wow. And then you've got the financial world. Yeah. Imagine if you could predict the stock market right. by looking at the collective mood of people on social media. Mm -hmm. Sentiment analysis can give you that type of insight, oh. although it's still being developed. It's like having a crystal ball for the stock market. Yeah. But instead of magic, it's AI. Ex exactly. But it's important to remember that sentiment analysis, like any tool, yeah. could be used in ways that are both good and potentially bad. So it's not just about the technology itself, but how it's developed and used and regulated. Precisely. Yeah. It's about making sure that it's used ethically and responsibly, Right. which is a whole other conversation. For sure. But speaking of complex systems, okay. let's switch gears to something even more mind-blowing. Right. The world of digital twins. So we're going from figuring out emotions, mm -hmm. from tweets to building virtual replicas of the human body. We are. That feels like a huge jump. It is a big jump. Okay. But there are some really cool parallels. Okay. Just like sentiment analysis tries to figure out all the little details of human emotion. Right. Building a digital twin of something like the immune system yeah. means you have to model a huge network of interactions and processes. Okay, so for those of us who haven't gone to medical school, yeah. what is a digital twin? Yeah. And how would it even work for something as complex as the immune system? Imagine if you had a virtual copy of your body okay. that doctors could use to run simulations and test out different treatments without actually having to touch you. Wow. That's basically what a digital twin is. Okay. It's a virtual representation of a physical system. Mm -hmm. It's always being updated with real-time data. Okay. And that allows researchers to study and predict its behavior. Wait, so you're saying they could, like, expose my digital twin to a virtual virus yeah. and see how my immune system would react in real life? Exactly. That's incredible. It's like having a personalized avatar for medical research. Right. This could totally change personalized medicine mm -hmm. because instead of relying on trial and error with different medications, right. doctors could use your digital twin to see what treatment would work best for you. Wow. With the fewest side effects. My mind is officially blown. Yeah. <laughs>Welcome back to The Deep Dive. This is Next Level Stuff. Yeah. But how do you even begin to create something like that? It seems like trying to recreate the universe in a computer. It's super ambitious, huh. and there are some big challenges. Yeah. But researchers are making progress. Okay. They've come up with a four-stage process for developing them. Okay. And the first step is to figure out what the specific purpose of this digital twin is. Okay. Do we want it to predict how well somebody's going to respond to a certain drug? Right. Do we want to use it to help develop new vaccines? Okay. There are endless possibilities. So you wouldn't need to model the entire immune system right away. Exactly. Yeah. You start with a specific 
specific goal, and then you build from there. Okay. But even a simplified model yeah. requires tons and tons of data from genetic information to medical history. Okay. And it takes a deep understanding of all the complex interactions that are happening within the immune system. This is where I'm starting to get a sense of just how massive a task this is. It really is. Yeah. Building a digital immune system is not a solo mission. It takes a massive team effort. Right. We're talking immunologists, clinicians, software engineers, data scientists. Wow. Everyone has to work together to make this a reality. Wow. So it's really all about collaboration. Yeah. And speaking of working together, we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Okay. But don't go anywhere because when we come back, we're going to keep going deeper into the world of digital twins Just and see all the incredible potential they have for the future of medicine. Looking forward to it. So before the break, we were talking about building these virtual versions of our immune systems. Right. It sounds incredibly complex. It is a huge undertaking. Like trying to map out every single star in the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. So once you've figured out like what the point of your digital twin is mm -hmm. and you've gotten all this initial data, right. the next big thing is actually like building the model. Yeah. So how do you even start to create a virtual version of something as dynamic and intricate as the immune system. Well, you have to figure out the key parts and interactions that are the most important for what you're trying to do. Right. You wouldn't necessarily need to model every single cell and molecule. Okay. At least not right away. So you start with a more simplified version. Exactly. Cool. And then you add more complexity as you go. And that's where the really cool stuff happens. Yeah, that's where the magic happens. Okay. You take the data from a specific patient, right. like their medical history, their genetic profile, even their lifestyle, yeah. and you can personalize that model right. to make a digital twin that reflects their unique immune system. So it's like taking a blueprint yeah. and then customizing it yep. to match how their immune system is actually set up. Exactly. Wow. And once you have this personalized digital twin, oh, yeah. you can start running simulations. Exactly. You can expose it to like virtual pathogens. Okay. You can test out different treatments and see how it responds. Mm -hmm. So instead of doctors just having to guess which medication is going to work best for a patient, right? they can run virtual trials on their digital twin and see what happens. Exactly. Wow. That has the potential to get rid of so much of the trial and error that happens in medicine right now. It does. Which could lead to better treatments, mm -hmm. fewer side effects. Right. And just like better health outcomes for everybody. Absolutely. That's incredible. But I know you said there are four stages to this development process. Yeah. What are the final two? Right. So after you've built your model and you've personalized it, yeah. the next step is to test it and make sure it works. Okay. So we have to ask. Does the digital twin accurately show how a real immune system behaves? Mm -hmm. Can we trust the predictions it's making? So it's not just like a build it and forget it kind of thing. No, not all. There's constant monitoring and tweaking involved. Yeah, it's a process okay. where you're constantly making adjustments. So researchers are comparing what the digital twin does right. to real world data exactly. from clinical trials mm -hmm. and just like actual patient outcomes. Yeah, and they use that information to make the model more accurate. Right, and this is where the collaboration is so important again. Exactly. Because you need feedback from doctors and data scientists yeah. and, of course, the patients themselves of course. to make sure the digital twin is showing what's really going on. Precisely. And this all leads to the fourth and final stage, okay. which is to constantly be collecting more data and refining the model. Okay, so as we get more data from patients, we can make the model even better. Exactly. And accurate, more powerful. And that's what makes this technology so amazing. Right. Because it's constantly evolving, just like our immune systems are constantly adapted. It's like the digital twin itself is learning over time. That's a great way to put it. Which is wild. Yeah. So you're saying that in the future, we could use digital twins not just for personalized medicine, yeah. but also for creating new drugs and vaccines. Mm hmm Testing how effective public health interventions are. Yes. Maybe even predicting and responding to pandemics. Exactly. Wow. It's like having a crystal ball for the future of healthcare. It really is. It's about moving away from just reacting to health problems right. to actually being proactive. So instead of waiting for people to get sick, yeah. we could use digital twins to figure out what the risks are. Exactly. Figure out how to prevent those problems mm -hmm. and just try to make it so people are healthier for longer. Precisely. No. That's a future I can get behind. It's a good one. But let's be real for a second. Okay. What are some of the challenges that are standing in the way of making these 
digital immune systems a reality? Well, data management is a big one. Okay. You're talking about dealing with these incredibly complex and diverse sets of data mm -hmm. from genetic sequences to medical records oh. and putting them all together in a way that's accurate and secure. Right. It's like you're gathering all the books in the Library of Congress. Yeah. And then you have to organize them so they make sense. Yeah, exactly. Which is a huge task. It really is. And it takes cutting edge technology and expertise. So what kind of timeline are we looking at here? Okay. How far off are we from actually seeing these digital twins being used in medicine? The research says it could be about seven years. Seven years? Yeah. That's both really ambitious. Yes. And surprisingly, not that far away. Yeah, it's closer than you think. It is. Wow. Yeah. That's exciting. I like to think about the possibilities. Yeah. But before we get too carried away with the future, sure. you mentioned earlier that there are some similarities between sentiment analysis right. and digital twins. Mm -hmm. And I want to unpack that a bit more. Okay. How do these two things, yeah. which seem so different on the surface, right. how do they connect to this larger picture of AI mm -hmm. and how it could impact society? That's a great question. And it gets to the core of what makes this research so interesting. Okay. Sentiment analysis and digital twin technology are all about using AI to understand complicated systems, mm. whether it's human emotion or the human body. So it's not just about building machines that are smarter. No. It's about using those machines to understand ourselves and the world around us better. Exactly. And that's where things get really interesting. Yeah. Because if we can use AI to understand something as complex as the human immune system, right. what other challenges could we solve that seem impossible right now? Exactly. That is a question we're thinking about. It is. And I think it's the perfect way to transition into the final part of our deep dive today. Okay. Where we can explore the bigger implications of this technology. Sounds good. So we've spent this whole deep dive talking about how AI can like decode our emotions yeah. and simulate our immune systems, mm -hmm. which is amazing in itself. Yeah. But the research we read hinted at even bigger things. Okay. Like, could this technology actually help solve problems like global warming? Yeah, it's possible. That feels like a whole other level. It is. So how could something like sentiment analysis, no, which we've no. mostly been talking about with like customer reviews in the stock market, yeah. how could that be used to tackle something as big as climate change? Well, imagine being able to keep track of how the public feels about climate change and not just how they feel, but like why they feel that way in well, real time. Okay. This could help policymakers design better campaigns right. address people's concerns more directly. Okay. And maybe even motivate everyone to work together. So it's like using AI to bridge the gap between the science of climate change yeah. and how people are actually reacting to it. Exactly. That's really cool. And then there's the potential of digital twins with this. Okay. Like imagine you could create a virtual model yeah. of a whole ecosystem wow. or even like a city. Wait, so instead of just having a digital twin of one person's immune system, right. you could have one for an entire city. Exactly. Wow. And we could use those models to see how things like pollution are affecting everything. Okay. We could test out different ways to make the city more sustainable mm -hmm. and design cities that can handle the effects of climate change. So we could use AI to like fast forward and see what would happen exactly. if we made certain changes. Yeah, it lets us experiment and learn much faster. That makes sense. Which is super important when we're talking about these huge global problems. This is all really exciting. It is. But I also have to imagine there's some downsides too, right? Of course. I mean, we t talked about the ethical stuff with AI before. Right. But when we start talking about using it for global problems, it feels even more important. It is. You're like a... The stakes are higher. Yeah. And as we develop these technologies, we have to be careful right. and really understand what the risks are. So... It's not just about what we can do. It's about what we should do. Exactly. Because we want to make sure these technologies help everyone. Right. Not just a small group of people. Yeah. And we need to think about things like bias in the data. We have to make sure everyone has access to these technologies. Right. And that everything is transparent and accountable. It sounds like this could change how we think about and try to solve these global challenges. It could. It's not just about finding the technology, yeah. but making sure we're all working together and thinking ethically. Exactly. And that we all share the responsibility. Yeah. It's about recognizing that AI isn't a perfect solution, right. but it's a tool that can help us work together and create a better future. So as we wrap up this deep dive, yeah. what's the one thing you want listeners to take away from all of this? 
I think the most important thing is that we're still just starting to figure out what AI can really do. Right. This technology is changing so quickly. Yeah. And the choices we make today will affect the world for a very long time. So we can't just sit back and watch. No, we all need to be involved in shaping how AI develops. It's absolutely. We need to ask questions yes. and demand transparency mm -hmm. and make sure that this technology is being used to make the world a better place for everyone. Exactly. That's a great message to end on. Yeah. So to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this deep dive. Thanks, everyone. We hope this got you thinking about the potential of AI Yeah. and how important it is to consider all of the implications. It is. The future isn't set in stone. Yep. And we all yep. have a role to play in figuring out what AI's place in it will be. That's My esteemed endocrine explorers and beloved biometric broadcasters, we've reached the end of our journey through the AI-powered looking glass of healthcare. Feeling like your brain just went through a full body scan? Yeah, mine too. So what's your take? Ready to embrace your digital health twin and AI therapist? Or are you clutching your analog medical records a little tighter? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Are you team bring on the health tech revolution? or keep your algorithms off my antibodies. Your voice matters in this grand experiment we call the future of wellness. Remember, every medical breakthrough in history started with someone asking, what if? So keep questioning, keep exploring, and who knows, maybe you'll be the one to create the next big health tech innovation. Just promise me you'll use your powers for good, okay? No AI-powered hypochondria generators, please. The world isn't ready for that level of digital diagnosis drama. Until next time, stay curious, stay skeptical, and for the love of all that is cellular, don't forget that your body is still the most amazing piece of biotech out there, AI enhanced or not. This is Theodore, signing off from the intersection of bits and biology. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go make sure my digital health twin hasn't diagnosed me with anything weird. It's way too thorough for its own good.